Hey, so glad you're here. Um, if you're a guest or you're new to our community, I guess you're, you're, you're most welcome. Uh, thanks for being so brave. I know it takes a lot of guts and a lot of effort to show up in a new place and not just show up, but to actually connect with people. So thank you. Um, and uh, I want to introduce you to a few people, and I want to introduce you to a few ideas. My name's Travis, and I'm the lead pastor here. Um, but the, the first idea, um, if you don't know, I guess I would say even to those who've been a part of this church for a long time, I just want to remind you we're a part of a wider family of churches. So Radiant belongs to a family of churches called Confluence. And it's been a source of great strength to be connected to something bigger than ourselves. It's brought incredible opportunities to us. And we think it's really healthy to, for a local church to have people on the outside looking in on what's going on. Um, so it's been so cool to receive different voices uh, into the mix here. A lot of the churches, a growing number of the churches in our family have what is called a gap year, which is a year of intentional discipleship either before, during, or after college. So these are springing up uh, not just here uh, in Visalia, but in other churches. So I, I, I'm so excited because we have the gap year from St. Louis, Missouri in the house. And we've got, yeah. And we've got an intern from Tacoma, Washington as well. Well, he's not from Tacoma, but he's in Tacoma. So would you guys go ahead and stand and would we greet these gappers, these interns and welcome them? Yeah. And I do uh, want to introduce or I guess um, announce with some, not some, I'm struggling this morning. How many cups of coffee? I think I've only, I've only got one in me. This is the issue. So uh, our registration for our gap year program is open now. So if you know people or you are one of those people who's interested, please sign up. It's a great great thing that's started and continuing to pick up steam where we spend a whole year focusing on the whole world the whole word of God the whole counsel of God's word so we go Genesis to Revelation uh, together we also focus on the whole person and allow God to heal some of the hurts that have us hung up and then there's an emphasis on the whole world where we want to get caught up in what God's doing around the globe so our gap year will be taking off to India on the 29th of March for a couple weeks so you can be praying for them but registration's open so if you're considering it or if you know someone who is you can investigate it or if you have questions you can come my way or Danny Cantelmi's way or Danny Bartlett's way find a leader and ask some questions because it's a good thing God's doing in Gen Z right now there's a good thing going on so we're excited to participate in that I also want to introduce to you guys our guest speaker uh, for this morning. Tim, would you come? Yeah. This is Tim Chambers. And Tim, you may recognize because he's been coming to Radiant for 10 years. Yeah. We just looked at photos from 2013 uh, together, which would have been his first trip uh, here. Uh, he and his wife, Mary, live in Joplin, uh, Missouri. And I would say one of the best parts of being a part of this family of churches has been Uncle Tim and Aunt Mary. Uh, they're everything that a good aunt and uncle are. They're, they're unique. They're interesting. They've got some uh, wild stories. There's a fair amount of hippie and granola in them. For two people from Missouri, uh, they don't exactly fit some of my stereotypes. They've, they've lived in a storage container that they converted into a home. <laughs> I love their stories, but like they have a real heart for the word of God a real heart for what God's doing in the nations and a real heart for the local church. So they've been a huge uh, blessing to us here. So happy to hear, uh, happy to have him share with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
before we met, well, before we, before we made our first trip out here, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I, I remember when the group, the, the, a few leaders came to a conference in Missouri, and I would include Trav, and uh, I thought, I hope we have a future with these people because they are so much fun. And uh, I still feel that we're, ha we're, still, we're still having fun, as the song says. And uh, it's a joy to be with you. And it's, it's really cool to have seen what God has done over those 10 years. We're looking at videos last night from 10 years ago. And I mean, uh, yeah, a lot's changed. I mean, the way the church has grown, I mean, just, it's just so beautiful how God's blessed you over this period of time. And we're, we're so happy, Mary and I are so happy to be with you today. So um, before, uh, you know, when, when Trav asked me to come out, uh, we talked about things I could talk about. And um, I, I have this thing that I've been interested in about, about the different ways that the Holy Spirit's described in Scripture. You know, he's um, like, there's like uh, anointing oil, like oil. That's like a, that's a Holy Spirit thing, you know. And so is uh, wind, like, uh, because and that's a real common one, because, or, or breath. Actually, in Greek, that's one word. Wind or breath is, is the same word. It's um, pneuma, which, you know, like pneumatic, uh, moved by air or pertaining to gases, that uh, was the definition. And, and actually, in, if, you're, if you're like a, go to a theological school, pneumatology is the section of theology concerned with the Holy Spirit. So, um, so but then there's water, uh, which is also, you know, uh, a, a thing that is, the Spirit is compared to water in some ways. And I thought, uh, and that's actually the one I'm going to talk about this morning, is about the Holy Spirit, this, the, the water of life. And um, now I didn't know uh, w when I came out here that you were going to be in the middle of flooding. So, so you know, in Joplin years ago, we had a, a, like a, a really destructive tornado that just tore our town apart. So, so this might be kind of like if you came to my town right after the tornado and wanted to talk about the Holy Spirit being like wind. <laughs> it, it, I, so I hope the analogy is not too tender for, for you. <laughs> so hitting a, a, a tender spot. But, but uh, well, let's, let's look at the, we, if somebody's gonna, somebody else is going to read this text. Joe, please read, come and read the text. <clears throat> Welcome, Joe. Hey. Thank you. Would you guys join me in reading the scripture? Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. We're going to be reading 1 Corinthians 12, chapter, uh, first, yeah, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 13, and you can read it up here. Or if you'd like, there's a Bible in front of most chairs, and you can keep that if you want. <clears throat> All right. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that you, when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, 
So it is with Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Man, I love that passage. You can't even really say that Jesus is Lord and mean it without help from the Holy Spirit. He's not saying you couldn't mouth the words. He's saying if you're, if you're actually like recognizing who Jesus is, you got help. You got help from somewhere. So love that whole passage. Kind of would like to talk through every bit of it, but I wanna, I'm going to confine myself here as I, best I can to the passage, to this phrase, you know, this final phrase about in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body and we were all given one spirit to drink. This is, this is really uh, like what unifies us is this baptism into Jesus, you know, this is what we've all experienced. And, and, and he, he, you note know how he talks about our diversity. You know, we're all we're from different ethnic backgrounds, we, different circumstances of life. And that, that's one of the glorious things about the church is like how, how it's beautiful diversity, like where you came from. And I mean, I think it's even cool that like we were all sinners, but we were different kinds of sinners. So like we got, we, we were, we were, we had, each of us had our own particular set of addictions from which Jesus delivered us, you know? So, so anyway, uh, we were all baptized into this spirit or made to drink. One, one translation says, I like that one too. It's like, yeah, go here, drink this, you know? So, uh, so I, I wanted to think this morning uh, about the water of life and the privilege of drinking. And I want to start by actually looking at something in John's gospel. This is, uh, I think it's ver chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Uh, the context here is Jesus has gone up to Jerusalem to, for the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. It's one of the three major festivals commanded uh, uh, by God through Moses. You're going to go and do this. It's a, it's a fall harvest festival. It lasts about a week. And I think this would have been my favorite of those, because basically what you do is you, you take the whole family up to Jerusalem and you camp out. You like build a little hut, you know, and everybody like lives in their little huts or if they had tents, maybe they, you know, your, your pop-up tent, you know, and, and they, would just, they would just live like that and like celebrate God for a week, you know. I mean, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? And um, actually... Um, I looked it up. This year, this year uh, it starts on 2023. It'll start on September, Friday, September 29th. So if you want to put that on your calendar, that you should take a time to just like go camp out, you, you could do that and sort of celebrate it by, your, by yourself, I guess. But, but anyway, so it's the last day of that feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the great day. And on that day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And, and whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, there's things about this little, little section that have baffled me for a while. <clears throat> I've wondered about it. Jesus is making a public invitation, right? I mean, he's in front of a whole bunch of people, and he speaks loudly and says, if anybody's thirsty, if anybody's thirsty, Jesus says, come here, come to me and drink. And then it says, yeah, see, I've always wondered, like, what if somebody comes? Because it says then the spirit hadn't been given yet, you know? So, so actually, I, I've really, I, like, that's one of the questions I want to ask when I get to heaven. It's like, hey, Jesus, what would you have done if somebody, like, came right now and said, what, you mean I have to wait? I thought you said we could come now, you know? So anyway, 
It, but, but anyway, it, it, he, it wasn't available yet. Jesus was inviting them to something that wasn't available yet. And I, the only thing I can think about this is like maybe he wants to make them thirsty in advance. You know, like sometimes you tell people, yeah, we're going out to eat. And let me tell you what it's going to be like, you know, because it makes you want to go when you find out what the menu is, you know. So maybe it's something like that. So, but, but what's significant here is that Jesus says, Jesus tells me, Listen to this. It's wild. Jesus tells me that if I drink what he provides, then, he's, then, then something's going to flow back out of me. Did you catch that? It's not just like a one-way thing. Something flows into us, and then once it's in us, it flows back out. So, so that's really cool. And so it's... it's uh, he says it's like li- it's living water. It's live water. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you're buying uh, property, you know, it will say like if it has live water on the property, that means there's there's something springing up and flowing, you know, and uh, and usually that adds value to the property if there's live water on. But anyway, um, he says <clears throat> he says that this is something inside you that will flow back out of you. Um, so. I thought, well, what might that look like if something's flowing back out of you? And I think it would probably look a little bit like Pentecost because, you know, the Holy Spirit came on people and then something flowed out of them, didn't it? Didn't it? And what was it, by the way? Well, I mean, it's cool that what came out of them was in languages that people, you know, that they hadn't learned. I mean, that's really cool. But the content is important, too. Because what the people who are hearing in all of these different languages, say, we hear them proclaiming the mighty works of God. Yeah. And actually, I think on Pentecost, I can think of all sorts of mighty works that they might have thought about. They might have like, thought about things all the way back to their deliverance from Egypt, you know, right up to the fact that just recently Jesus put an end to death. <laughs> you know, I mean, a whole bunch of stuff had happened. So, so anyway, there's movement, you know, and, and, you, and it's verbal. It flows out of my mouth. And, and that got me thinking about this idea about, about my mouth being compared to a stream of water. And uh, so what, what flows in and what flows out, those are things we should be very interested in. And, um, and so this, this, this analogy goes throughout Scripture. So I want to look at this. This is James 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, James writes, From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. That's not good. That's what he says. My brothers, these things ought not be. He says, Can a fountain simultaneously send forth from the same opening fresh water and bitter? So, well, the answer is no, you can't have that. Uh, We just can't do that. Um, uh, So, I need another page here. So, then uh, the next thing is that this is not the only time that Jesus makes this offer. Um, he'd, he'd made a, a similar offer earlier to this uh, woman. And then you're, this is a familiar story to you. It's in John 4. Jesus left Judea. He went to Galilee. And he had to go through Samaria. And he, he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Oh, and by the way, it's still there. Jacob's well is still there. If you go, you can, you can actually go see it. Uh, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw, and Jesus said, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said, How is it that you, a Jew, asks for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? And then in parentheses, the Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water, this moving stream. And the woman said, you don't have anything to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that? Where do you get that living water? 
You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said, everybody who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Oh, can I sing you a song? It's not in my notes. It goes like this. Uh, I'm feasting on the living bread. I am drinking from the fountain head. For whoso drinketh, Jesus said, shall never ever thirst again. What? Never thirst again? No, never thirst again. What? Never thirst again? No, never thirst again. And whoso drinketh, Jesus said, shall never ever thirst again. Isn't that good news? Such good news. Because the water of life that I give this person will become within him or her a, sp a spring lean producing eternal life. A spring that produces eternal life. Oh, aren't we happy about this? So, and that reminds me of this very cool prophecy about water in the Old Testament. It's in Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel says, uh, the Lord kind of brought him uh, back to the door of the house. This is uh, the temple. And, and look, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from the south of the altar. Okay, so the altar, you know, that's the place of sacrifice. This is where they, they do the sacrifices that uh, they didn't actually atone, but they were a marker of your faith in the eventual atoning work of Jesus, you know. So it's, something's flowing. This references basically the atoning work. And from the place of the atoning work, there's water flowing out. And um, he brought me out by way of the north gate, and he led me around to the outside, uh, to the outer gate, by way of the gate that faces east, and water was trickling down from the south side. When the man went out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits, and he led me through the water, and the water was up to my ankles. Again, he measured a thousand, and he led me through the water, and the water reached the knees. And then he measured another thousand and led me through the water, and it reached the loins. And he measured another thousand, and it was a river that I could not ford, for the water had risen. It was water enough to swim in, a river that could not be forded. Now, now here's what I think I'm seeing here, is that the further it goes, the bigger it gets. And, 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 and here again, we're talking about what the Spirit of God does. And, and that's really glorious news because it's, it, came, you know, it came all the way to Visalia. The stream, the stream of the water flowed and it, it overran the banks and ended up here, you know? And uh, isn't that good? So happy about that. And, um, and then, so he says, he says to the son of the man, he said, he, oh, he says to me, son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me back to the bank of the river. And when I returned, the bank of the river, there were very many trees on one side and on the other. And he said to me, these waters go out to the eastern region and down into the Arabah and to the sea, being made to flow into the sea. And the waters of the sea become fresh, and it will come about that every living creature which swarms every place the river goes will live. So here, here again, he's, he's coming and he's, he's saying, look, look at these trees, you know. Oh, and you guys have trees too, don't you? So you got trees and you got water. So this is very applicable to your local circumstance. So, <laughs> and... Uh, these trees, and, and, and there's life wherever the river goes. And then I like this part, too. Uh, the, next, the next verse says, there are going to be very much fish. You got fisher, fishermen here? You like to, people like to fish? Yeah, very many fish, for the waters go there. And, and, and the, this makes 
This stream makes bitter water fresh. Did you pick that up? This stream that flows, the river of life, is strong enough to make bitter streams sweet. This, this is cool. So there's life where it goes. These trees that produce fruit and these fish and this fisherman will stand beside it from En Gedi to Iglium, and there will be a place for the spreading of nets, and their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the great sea, very many. And so, so who, I think as a church, we should cast out our nets and expect that there would be many kinds of fish, including some astoundingly weird ones. You know? Because, I mean, have you seen those pictures of the weird fish that are at the bottom of the ocean, you know? I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's crazy things in the ocean. And he's saying, all those, all those varieties will be caught in the net of divine grace. <laughs> I'm getting too happy. So, oh, yeah, very many, very many fish. And then he says in verse 11, but the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Now, this is, there's a warning here. There's a warning. You can actually experience God once and then not. Well, that, that would be tragic, wouldn't it? By the riverbank on one side and another is going to be these trees, these trees, but, but just go a little ways off, and there's a place where the, there's not water flowing anymore. And it's a marsh, which means there's mosquitoes probably. So it doesn't say so in the text, but I think the marsh is not attractive. Um, and these trees, uh, they bear, they, they don't wither, their fruit will not fail. This is a promise. This is a promise concerning God's work as he waters the church that, that it's, it's going to bear fruit. As the Holy Spirit's at work in you, there's going to be fruit. All kinds of trees. The leaves won't wither. The fruit won't fall. They'll bear every month because the water flows from the sanctuary. The holy place, from God's presence, the water flows. And because of this, they won't wither and their fruit won't fail. And their fruit will be food and their leaves will be for healing. So, oh gosh, I'm getting goosebumps. But where this thing flows, people get healed. Their bodies get healed. Their minds get healed. Their, their brokenness is repaired. Where the river flows. This is what this water does. And, th and the leaves of the tree. I think, okay, if you're planted by the river, you know, then you bear your fruit and the leaves on the tree, the, 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 they, they bring healing to people. Praise God. So, I, I, I mean, like I want to pause and say that it's such good news for Vesalia that God's got a presence here because people can get healed. I found this song a few years ago. I, I, I'm not going to sing this one, but I like these lyrics. It's by Michael and Stormy Omartian, Omartian I think it is. It says, I want to be in the mainstream. I don't want to be left on the shore. I want to be in the mainstream when the river changes course. I want to be in the mainstream of the Holy Spirit's flow. I want to live in the center wherever it may go. Wherever it may go. He says, some people drift to the edges while the current is barely in sight. Some make their stand on the left bank while the river bends to the right. But I want my life to be gentle. And by the way, the word gentle in the Bible doesn't just mean, you know, uh, well, it it basically means you can, you can be trained and redirected. Uh, that's, that's part of the meaning of the word. Um, <clears throat> I want my life to be gentle in the center and depth of God's will. I want to move with his spirit. Let me never be caught, never be constantly still. 
a mighty moving ocean of power, a surge of the sacred supply. Oh, you'd like to say that one, wouldn't you? Would you like to say a surge of the sacred supply? Doesn't that sound fun to say on three? One, two, three. A surge of the sacred supply. Oh, Lord Jesus, the church needs a recurrent surge of the sacred supply. Yeah. Plot out the course and consider this source because the river will never run dry. I want to be in the mainstream. Don't want to be left on the shore. I want to be in the mainstream when the river changes course. I want to be in the mainstream of the Holy Spirit's flow, and I want to live in the center wherever it may go. Amen. 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 Preach it, Tim. So, uh, <laughs> so then, then I, I, it's just after this, I want to come to John 15. This is verse 26. It says, um, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So, you know, there are various kinds of streams, and the content of streams varies, right? And uh, I think that there's, a, there's a correspondence between streams of water and streams of what we might call information. Like there's, there's a stream, and, um, and music, you know, is streamed over the internet and over the radio, uh, and sometimes if I'm, I'm in the car alone, I will turn on the radio and I will p push the button that runs me through all the different channels. Do you have one of those in your car like, where you do that? You punch the button and it'll play you a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that until you hit the station that you like. And then you punch that one and you, that's where you, you stick, you know, so. So it gives me a few seconds before moving on to the next one. One channel's news, talk radio, country music, classic rock channel. And so if I'm like wanting to hear classic rock and, I'm, and it's clicking through the buttons and I heard Led, Led Zeppelin singing Whole Lot of Love, then I know which one I'm on, right? You can tell by the content what channel you're on. <laughs> Punch that one or say, oh, not that one, you know. So, it, and it's the content that you, you, you're deciding what content you want to consume, right? Okay. So... Um, there's a, there's a constant channel. There is a constant stream that never runs dry. And on this channel, the Holy Spirit testifies to the glory of Jesus, to His perfection, to His mighty works, to His great victory. He's constantly testifying. This is, this, this is the Holy Spirit channel. The Holy Spirit is not looking for attention. He is happy to point people to the Son of God and to the perfection of the Father. And, uh, and, and He points to the Father's delight in the Son. And the Holy Spirit channel speaks and sings of the Son's atoning work and of His ascension to the right hand of the Father and, and His present intercession for us. The Holy Spirit is the Jesus channel. It's the channel of the river of life, and it's always on whether you're tuned in or not. Occasionally, I've been in a car alone, driving and fretting about something, or discouraged, or slipping into pessimism or lethargy. And, and sometimes I have recognized that I am dialed in to the wrong channel. Or that the spring of the river of life within me, which is supposed to be springing up, is clogged. And there are always dark spirits somewhere nearby who are happy to stoke the fires of my discontent. Always. There are always spirits that will come to support your bad thoughts. They're waiting <laughs> to assist you in your negativity. And 
And sometimes what I've done when that occurs to me, this is particularly easy if I'm the only one in the car, I start to declare in a loud voice the perfections of my Savior. And when I do, it feels like I've gotten down into the muck and I'm cleaning out the spring. And the sweet water of life starts flowing again. It's a good thing. I can dial in to the Holy Spirit channel. This is Revelation 19 verse 10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. (laughs) It's all about him. The prophecy may be to you, but it's probably about him. It's about him and what he can do. (laughs) So, and then Revelation 21, five and six, we're about done here. It says, he who was seated on the throne says, look, I'm making all things new. And he said, write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. And he said, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Yeah, that's right. Let's clap about that. Thank you, Lord. Revelation 22, 1 and 2. He showed me the river of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Flowed down the middle of the street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, and it's bearing fruit, just like the prophet, Old Testament prophets said it would. And it yields its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And for all of the broken-hearted and messed-up people in Visalia. And the Spirit, Revelation 22, 17, this will be it. The Spirit and the Bride say to you, the Holy Spirit and the Bride of Christ, the Church of God, say to you, whatever circumstance you're in this morning, come. Come. Let everyone who's thirsty come. Everyone who desires, come and take this water. It's priceless, and you don't have to pay for it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your rich provision. Thank you that you've put a spring inside us that wells up and produces life. And I pray, Lord, that we'll keep the channel clear and that we will be, because of that, because of what's flowing through us, a blessing to those around us, both those who are already in your house and those who are outside. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.